Uh, to round this session off, we've got John Pawsey. John will be known to many of you as a, a leading light in uh, arable organic production. Uh, he's a fourth generation farmer from Suffolk. John sits on a number of organic uh, bodies and was also one of the finalists in this year's Farmers Weekly Arable Farmer of the Year Awards. As David mentioned, uh, we all know we're losing chemicals through regulation resistance faster than new ones are being developed. So, John, your presentation is very timely. Over to you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I've just been to a enlightening session by Heather Wildman, where she said, described a farm practice as a bit wanky. <laughs> and some of you in this room might think that organic uh, farming, uh, that's a pretty good description of some organic farming practices, but I hope that I can convince you that we are doing something uh, slightly different. And I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to teach you, I'm just going to tell you what we do. So, uh, briefly, um, we've got about 1,300 hectares of organic cropping. Uh, we've got 1,000 breeding ewes, which we brought into the farm progressively, progressively since 2014. And we've got about 0.6 of a horsepower per hectare. And uh, I went to a talk the other day, we're in the sort of top 25% of uh, farms as far as fixed costs are concerned. We've got two full-time staff, but we get plenty of other people in to help when we need them. Uh, we've got two uh, part-time shepherds at the moment. Actually, they're, they're just stopping. We're just employing a full-time shepherd now. Uh, as I say, additional part-time help in busy periods. We've got a six-year rotation, uh, but it includes uh, all of these things down here. I'm not sure if I can do... Is this a button? Does the middle button do the thingy? No, no it doesn't. Uh, but it's basically a, a broad um, a split of winter and spring combinable crops uh, with some exotics like uh, quinoa and buckwheat, and we grow quite a lot of spelt at the moment as well. Uh, but in there we have two-year lays and diverse clover lays, uh, spring beans and winter beans and vetches, and we also grow some red clover for seed. Um, but out of that 1,360 hectares, about 1,000 is cropped, and the rest of it is either feeding sheep or in fertility building. So I'm, I'm splitting this into sort of three sections of weeds, pests, and diseases, and just go through what we, we do. Um, and I sort of feel I'm slightly teaching uh, my grandmother to suck eggs. Um, one person once asked me, you know, what is our primary source of weed control? And I said, there is just no one solution. There's no silver bullet. You have to be doing absolutely everything. And so uh, rotation design. Uh, generally, I would say that you know, organic farmers do probably grow a broader range of crops than uh, non-organic farmers, which give different opportunities for weed control. Cultivation, a uh, range of cultivations, depth and timings uh, should be used to target uh, weed problems. Uh, drilling dates, so autumn and spring is the obvious one, but, you know, growing different crops in those two um, seasons also gives you the chance to control different weeds. So our spring barley would be going in in sort of March, early March time if possible, and our quinoa would be going in sort of mid-April. So uh, it's about field selection and knowing the problems that you have in each field and selecting the right crop for that field. So it's sort of micromanagement as far as that's concerned. Um, crop competition. Uh, there's a huge difference in the competitive nature of crops. And if you're looking at something like linseed, which we uh, have grown a small amount of in the past, versus spelt, uh, the competition you get from spelt is phenomenal. It grows up to about this tall. And we also grow some heritage wheats under contract, which grow to a similar height. And you know they do particularly well in fields where possibly we have a charlet problem or even black grass. Uh, crop spacing. You know, ideally you want to space seeds evenly, uh, equidistant from each other. But if you want to inter ho which is what we have to do, uh, you have to decide which, what spacing is best for each crop. And also companion cropping. Uh, there's a picture here of some spring oats, which we've undersown uh, at about growth stage 32 with some buckwheat. So in the last time we go through our hoe, we put a seed in the ground to uh, produce some shading to try and shade out weeds within the rows. Uh, also, allelopathy, uh, oats and barley are particularly good for us, but there's lots of other crops. We've been managed to breed it out of our, our modern wheat varieties, but there's plenty of other crops you can grow that have a, a significant effect as far as that's concerned on weeds. I've also put drainage here. You know, I abused my drainage system that my grandfather put in for huge amounts of money 
in probably the 1960s and 70s, and we're going back to making sure that our fields are properly drained, our ditches are dug, and uh, they're, they're mole drained regularly. Uh, livestock, uh, and going back to the last speaker, a bit about you know soil fertility, healthy competitive crops actually do compete with weeds much better. But we do have problem weeds. Um, you know, wild oats actually was, was probably our worst one. And I, I always say the story, but when I first started working with my grandfather, I came into lunch one day and uh, he said, um, did you see that wild oat at the t at the, in the field sort of waving away? And I said, yes, I did. And he said, well, what are you doing in for lunch? You know, go and pull it. And um, so, but, and black grass as well, but less so, creeping thistles, docks, and we do have patches of charlocks and poppies in some fields, but they're managed through these different processes. Uh, mechanical weeding. We do uh, use harrowcone weeders and weed surface, and we do uh, use rogers as well. Uh, but we also use um, System um, Chameleon, which was a Swedish machine that I imported the first one in 2015. It's a low-draft, low-disturbance drill, but it's also an inter-row inter hoe uh, using camera guidance as well as using our RTK system on the farm. Uh, our cereals are, are sown on 25 centimetre rows uh, and our beans are sown on um, 50 centimetre rows. But the Swedes have been doing a lot of work on looking at 33 centimetre rows in cereals and then sowing your uh, cereals in a band of 10 centimetres to try and give them a little bit more room. But at the moment we're hoeing 70% of the field but under that system we'll be able to hoe 80% of the field. Uh, but the parallelogram design here is absolutely key because it means that the hoe is always at the correct cutting angle at all times. If you buy a hoe that's on a spring time, depending on your soil type, and it, they work very well on some soil types, but on our soil type they don't, is that you need to have that sort of constant depth of hoeing, just sculping the, uh, the tops of the weeds off in their roots, and that's uh, how you kill them. Uh, you can't leave any roots for, to allow them to sort of um, reset themselves. But also, um, uh, more aggressive hoeing means that we can hoe later. We used to hoe once or twice, and now we just hoe once. Um, uh, the tungsten tips on the fronts of those coulters uh, allow the hoe to en enter the ground into, in, in, very, uh, in the toughest of conditions and, and allow the ho hoe to work effectively. Um, also, the other thing is that the big thing we need to do is to build fertility to be able to support our rotation. And uh, with this hoe, we used to scratch it on with uh, our, our fertility crops uh, in the spring, in, in spring cereals usually, and uh, we scratched it with the cedar box in the back end, we've got very uneven germination. This drills it in, so that while you're doing your last pass with the hoe, and you can see a crop of um, clover coming up in between some rows of spring barley there, it drills it straight onto the moisture, and then the, seed, the tire rolls it in, and we've had 100% establishment since then. Uh, so, uh, again, 100% success in sowing lays, potential for seed savings as well because of better seed placement, increased fertility, increased yields, and better weed suppression. I've got a quick video of it working here, actually. Hope it's going to work. It did do that when I last did it. Did it? Can you just make that? Or do I press that again? There we go. So you can see every single uh, hoe is, is independently mounted. So they're not on banks, and so they, they give an incredibly... And there's these little tines at the back that where the hoe doesn't go, it's sort of a very solid tine that rips out the weeds next to the row of the crop. Uh, pests, again, you know, diversity in cropping, complex rotations help the avoidance of one species dominating. Uh, disrupting life cycles, you know, again, crop rotation, uh, drilling dates. Uh, important. Gout fly is a particular problem for us, so getting our spring crops in early or even just before Christmas is important. Uh, building beneficial insects. You know, if you don't have the stock, uh, then you don't have the defence, actually, when you have a sustained attack from a pest. As far as we're concerned, there's, you know, one or two, uh, you know, real problems that we've had, and that is, again, you know, uh, gout fly and spring wheats, but we're trying to address that by going earlier or even drilling just before Christmas. Uh, pea and bean weevil has been a problem uh, in peas and beans, but also in our undersown lays as well, you know, the same species attacking our clover plants. Uh, black bean aphid means that there's a pretty, you know, black fly means there's a pretty no-no as far as we're concerned for, for spring beans. A uh, brookid beetle can be a problem. And also, even though I've never managed to um, 
get anybody to buy some organic rape off me, I think that it would be pretty impossible for us to grow organic rape in this country. Uh, diseases, um, again, you know, sowing dates, we never, for example, would be we never sow winter beans before the end of October because of uh, chocolate spots. But then going back to that, we, that's why we drill our beans on wider row spaces to try and avoid that microclimate where chocolate spot dominates in beans. So that's looking again at, at uh, crop spacing to address diseases. Uh, by cropping, so there's a crop hit, uh, Hold on, I'm sorry, I didn't switch the slide. Um, this is a bicrop of um, winter oats and winter beans. And this was trying to do two things. It was trying to disrupt disease within the winter beans, um, but also to try and level out. The one you know, big yield up and down we have is with winter beans. And it was trying to uh, address that yield differential by growing two crops together to ho hopefully try and get a decent average. Uh, in that case, the winter oats dominated. But we did have the highest crop of winter oat highest yielding crop of winter oats we've ever had. Uh, varietal blending, I'm, I'm sure lots of you do that in the, in the room, uh, but we've also grown the Wakelands population, which is a, a cross population of lots of, lots of different um, uh, wheat varieties uh, crossed in, 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 the, in the lab. And, and so one, genetic, one plant never stands next to its genetic neighbour to try and uh, deal with uh, disease. And the disease issues we have, um, Septoria is one. Uh, yellow Ross in 2012 pretty much wiped out most of our wheat crop. Uh, fusarium, there's a big problem with the fusarium in organic seed. We have ours tested and we reject it if it's over 10% uh, fusarium or one spore uh, per seed of bunt. And again, uh, chocolate spot in, in beans. Uh, so, uh, just to conclude, um, and accepting uh, this quote, um, you know, I would say that you know, successful organic farming is all about uh, biological agriculture, uh, but the organic movement certainly does not have all the answers, uh, but we do have some of them, and uh, sharing that knowledge is key. Uh, it's a two-way street. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John.